All right, Genesis chapter 1. I, I want to read some things before we get started this morning. Um, how many know there are angels? And uh, this is angels explained by children. This is Gregory, age five. I only know the name of two angels, Hark and Harold. This is Olive, age nine. Everybody's got it wrong. Angels don't wear halos anymore. I forget why, but scientists are working on it. This is Mitchell, age seven. Angels work for God and watch over kids when God has to do something else. This is Jack, age six. Angels don't eat, but they drink milk from holy cows. This is Reagan, age 10. When an angel gets mad, he takes a deep breath and counts to 10. And when he lets out his breath, somewhere there's a tornado. Sarah, age six. Angels have to do a lot, and they keep very busy. If you lose a tooth, an angel comes in through your window and leaves money under your pillow. Then when it gets cold, angels go north for the winter. I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm learning stuff I did not know. Uh, Jared, age eight. Angels live in cloud houses made by God and his son, who is a very good carpenter. Antonio, age nine. All angels are girls because they got to wear dresses and the boys didn't go for it. Caitlin, age nine. My grandma, or my angel is my grandma who died last year. She got a big head start on helping me while she was still down here on the earth. Sarah, age seven. What I don't get about angels is why they shoot someone who is in love. They shoot them with arrows. Anyway, there might be some misinformation there. Genesis chapter 1. We've been talking about the topic of integrity. And again, when we talk about integrity, please understand we are not talking about perfection. It's not about having your whole act all together. But we have been defining integrity as living in alignment. To, to walk in integrity is to walk in alignment with myself. Now, I, I want to read this passage in Genesis 1. We're all familiar with it. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So man was created unlike anything else in creation. God created man according to his image and his likeness. That, that is extremely significant. And that is why God was able to give dominion to mankind. Let's keep reading. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let them have dominion over all the earth. Now, see, the earth was not all of God's creation. God's creation is great and vast. But the earth is the part of God's creation that man was given authority to rule over. Verse 27, so God created man in his own likeness. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. See, God created man, male and female. Many times in the Old Testament, when you see the word man, it's not a gender word. It does not mean male. It, it, it would be better to almost translate it as mankind, which God created male and female. Verse 28, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. When God created mankind, he also commissioned him. Man was to be fruitful and to multiply. He was to fill the earth and to subdue it. Now, the word subdue means to conquer. And to bring into subjection. It means to overpower by a superior force to overcome. You were created to exercise dominion in the earth. You were created to rule and reign where 
God has placed you. To, to have authority under God's authority, it's a delegated authority that comes out of being in right relationship with God. Now, to really get the whole picture, you know, sometimes to, to really understand some specifics, you almost have to look up and kind of get an overview of things. You are in a time, a season of training. You are being trained to rule and to reign with Christ throughout all of eternity. You might say we're in boot camp. God has given us certain things to overcome because you, you can't be an overcomer without having something to overcome. And see, you were created and commissioned by him to exercise dominion in the earth. You have each been given a sphere of influence. And God wants you to rule and reign in, under his authority. He wants you to rule and reign within that sphere of influence. Now, see, the Bible word for this sphere of influence is the word metron, M-E-T-R-O-N. And it refers to a sphere of influence. And I just want to read a couple of scriptures that have that word in it. Are you guys doing okay? Second Corinthians 10, verse 13. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the, the sphere, the metron, which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. The New Living Translation says that we will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned us. The English Standard Version, that we will boast only with regard to the area of influence. Did I, read, did I just read that one? Uh, did I read? Okay, let me just give the King James. But according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us. So this metron, this word that's translated sphere, area, measure, it refers to a, a sphere of influence or rule. God has given to each one of us a metron, a sphere of influence. God placed you on this planet, and he's put you in a specific place to be an influence for the kingdom of God. It's like it's your sweet spot in God. Now, this Greek word metron is also found in Ephesians 4, 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. God has given grace to each one of us according to the measure, the, the sphere, the, the metron of Christ's gift. According to the sphere of our assigned influence. God has given you grace to function, to be an influence for the kingdom within the sphere that he has given you. But, but this is where I'm going with this, okay? The first place we must learn to exercise authority is in relation to ourselves. That, that, that's where it all begins. If you rule your own house well, then you're in a position for more. Reigning first begins in my own life. How can I reign in my metron if I'm not reigning here? Uh, authority is groomed and, and developed closest to home. So, so this is what I'm, I'm trying to say in relation to um, what we've said so far. First, I must exercise authority over my own world. If, if I can't exercise authority over myself, if I can't live in alignment, catch that word, alignment with myself, then, then I'm really not ready to exercise a lot of authority around me. Now, what do I mean by being in proper alignment with myself? Man is a three-part being, and I, and I have a diagram for that. We were created by God, spirit, soul, and body. Our body is the external part of us that everyone can see. If you would just look around for a minute, you're going to see lots of bodies in here. That, it's the part of us that, that, that is visible to everyone. My soul consists of my mind, my will, 
and my emotions. And people get to experience that part of me or the, uh, how much the experience of that part of me is dependent upon the relationship that I have with them. The closer I am to someone, the more they will experience my thoughts and, and my will and, and my emotions. Now, my spirit is the part of me that was born again in the new birth. It's the part of me that has come alive, and the Holy Spirit is residing in that part of me. My, my spirit is what causes me to become God conscious. That was actually not the right diagram, but that's fine. Go to the one that talks about world consciousness, self-consciousness. See, each part of our being has a, a consciousness. My physical body is world conscious and we've been given five physical senses with which to perceive the world around us you know i don't know about you i know there's a debate on how good bacon is for you but i'm telling you when i can smell bacon it makes me hungry i don't know what it is see my body has this sense of smell to discern something i can see with my body i can hear with my body, I, I, I've got all these uh, physical uh, abilities to perceive the physical realm. Now, my soul is, is self-conscious, but my spirit is God-conscious, and that's not exactly right. Uh, my spirit is spirit realm-conscious. You mean like this? There's a reason I use a, a headset. So my spirit man has the ability to perceive into the spirit realm. That's, that's my God consciousness. But I can also discern spirits. I can also recognize what is of God and what is not of God. And so just as I can develop my physical senses, I don't know if you know this, you probably do. People that are blind have an incredible sense of hearing. Did you know that? It's like if, if, if you're missing a sense, it's like your other senses will become heightened to accommodate for that. I'm doing it again, aren't I? Kaba shandala baki. In the same way, our, my, our spiritual senses can become heightened and developed and, and increased by reason of use, by reason of exercise. As you exercise your spiritual senses, they become sharper and keener and more effective. I am a spirit being, I have a soul, and I live in a body. But the true me is my spirit man. I have a soul. I possess a mind, will, and emotions, and I live in a body, but my body is temporary. It's just my, my earthly tent. I, I will get a new one. Glory to God. I don't know what it is about. The older you get, the more you appreciate that. Like, I'm going to get a brand new body, but, but I, I don't... I, even though my spirit man is the most important part of me, and, my, and I, well, I have a soul, I possess a soul, and my body is temporary, I, it's my earth suit. The minute my body stops operating, I can no longer function on this planet. It, it's the vehicle that allows me to operate, so I do want to take very good care of my body. Bodily exercise profits a little, the Bible says, but godliness, is, it's more important. It's more significant. It has eternal value, but still, I need this vehicle. The first luxury car I ever bought, I bought it used from a friend of mine. He was a neighbor. His name was Don Rosenbaum, a, a local guy, great guy. I loved him. And um, he, uh, he would buy cars on eBay, fly to where they were, and drive them home. Well, he bought this. It was an Infiniti i30. And it had like 90,000 miles on it. But, but when I saw it, and I saw it was for sale, I said, Don, can, can, we, can, can Mickey and I try that car and check it out? We drove it around. It was, it, it was the first time I ever had a car with climate control. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
It's kind of like, Dave, the first time. You remember when you, your first, you got your first car with air conditioning in it? And you thought, I'm never going back. You know, it was like one of those times, and I just thought, wow, this is, and, and you know, he, he said, I'm going to sell this to you like you're one of my kids. So, so he knocked the price way down, and but, but I, let me tell you something about that car. 90,000 miles. I, I changed the, sh the oil meticulously on that car. And any time there was a manufactured, recommended, 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 service of some kind, I, I did it. I had it done. And I, when I sold that car, I believe it had 245,000 miles on it, and it was running good. I was not aware of a thing wrong with it. Because, see, I just wanted to keep that car humming down the road, and that's the same way I feel about my body. I want to do the things that are necessary to keep this body healthy. I know it's temporary. I know it's not my, not my eternal body. But in order to be here, it has to work. Does that make sense? So when I talk about being in alignment, I'm talking about my spirit and my soul. Because when my spirit and my soul are in alignment, my body will automatically come into alignment. Now you can put up the one with the arrow going up. See, when our, our spirit and our soul and our body are in alignment, we are living in the way that God created us to live. Now, again, we're defining integrity as being in alignment. Living in proper alignment with myself, where, where how I am on the inside is how I live on the outside. Living in authenticity, being real. See, not living in alignment, not living in authenticity takes a toll on my life. When we are not honest, when we are not real with those who are around us, it affects our hearts. It affects us inside. If I tell someone a lie, no matter what the reason, it affects my heart. And again, I'm not talking about my physical blood pump. Not that heart. I'm talking about the core of my being, the core of who I really am, the heart of man. Does that make sense? If you or I tell a lie, if we are deceptive in our communication, it throws us out of whack, out of sync. And it may not even be an outright lie. We, we just didn't share everything about something. We were hiding certain things. We shared it in a, in a way to make us look really good. But even that, see, will affect us on the inside. When we are not honest, when, when we portray an outward image that is different from how we are on the inside, it throws us off inside, and we are not in alignment. And it puts us in this place that we were not designed by God to live. And I don't know about you, but I hate that place. I hate that feeling. Because being in that place incapacitates me. It makes me ineffective. It affects my faith level. It affects my boldness. It affects my prayer life. But when I am right inside, when I am in proper alignment, the devil better watch out. See, when your heart is right, the devil is no match for you. That's why he continually tries to get us into this compromised place. His goal is to incapacitate us. Now, I want to read a couple of verses we read a couple of weeks ago. 1 John 3, 21 and 22. Beloved, if, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. If we are right in our heart, if we are in proper alignment, if our heart does not condemn us, we have great confidence toward God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Now, let me ask you, isn't that the place you want to live? Do you know it's not hard to get there? It's not a hard thing at all. Let's pray. Father, we are your sons 
and daughters. You have called us to be a people of integrity. You have called us to live in proper alignment. So, Father, I ask you to open your word today. We want to hear you. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge you. We want to know your thoughts. We want to know your ways. Father, I ask that you would speak to every heart today because I know that when you speak, you also release the power to bring to pass what you are saying. May your kingdom come in Jesus' name. Amen. Integrity has to do with honesty, not perfection, not sinlessness. Integrity is not perfection, but it is honesty. See, the very act of being honest releases something in the spirit realm. The act of not being honest puts an emotional strain on our lives, and we were not created by God to live that way because we end up living out of whack out of sync with how God created us to live. Now, we opened up this series uh, uh, several weeks ago with a, a scripture in Proverbs. I want to look at it again. Proverbs 10, 9. He who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will become known. And again, think of integrity as alignment. When we are in proper alignment, we walk and, and we live secure. We stand strong. But he who perverts his ways will be exposed. But, uh, the New Living Translation, but those who walk or follow crooked paths will slip and fall. The English Standard Version, but he who makes his way crooked will be found out. See, if I allow dishonesty and deception into my life, it will become known. The secret things will become known. It will eventually show itself. But see, way, way before that happens, it actually takes a toll on me instantly. Living in deception incapacitates me. Now, this is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Integrity has to do with self-alignment, with personal alignment. When, when what's going on in the inside of me is what's seen coming out of me, it lines up with what, what, what the external me. Put that, that diagram up one more time with the arrow. Well, when I walk in integrity, when I walk in alignment with myself, I, I, I will walk in kingdom authority and kingdom power. If I can reign over this inward area of my life, if I can have great authority, if I can exercise, the, again, I, I, when I talk about this, sometimes people listen to something like this and they think, oh man, how could I ever get there? It's actually very, very easy. If I can reign over this inward area of my life, I will have great authority in my metron. If my heart does not condemn me, I will have great confidence toward God. And whatever I ask, I receive from him. But when I am one way on the inside and another way on the outside, the Bible calls that hypocrisy. And, and that's not how God has called us to live. The idea of hypocrisy involves projecting a false image, being phony. Acting one way on the outside while being different on the inside. Projecting an image of me that I want you to buy into when really inside that's not who I am. We know that the word hypocrite comes from a Greek word that simply means an actor, a stage player, someone who is performing. They, they are projecting an image that they want you to believe. But see, the Christian life is not a performance. It's not a show. You are not an actor. This is not a play. Real life is about being real. Being who I am. It's not about trying to get people to think I am someone I'm not. It's not about projecting an image that, that you want others to believe about you. It's about coming clean and being real. 
And see, when we acknowledge our stuff, God can change us. But when we stop hiding our stuff, that's when we begin to, to experience the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There were, there were great performers in Jesus' day. That they were called the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus called them hypocrites. He was calling them phonies. They had this appearance of righteousness. They sounded. They acted very spiritual. But inside there was all this evil going on. But it was untouchable to God because they didn't own their stuff. They, they, they were hiding their stuff. So inside all this was going on. And Jesus had some really strong words for them. He openly rebuked the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. And I know uh, the last couple of Sundays that, that we've talked about integrity, I've read this passage. I'm not going to read it again. It's in Matthew 23, verses 25 through 28. But it was just strong words towards them. Jesus openly rebuked the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. But something I said two weeks ago, I want to say it again, and just get us thinking about this for a minute. Jesus never rebuked sinners for being sinners. Isn't that interesting? You don't find him doing that. Now, he didn't condone their sin, but he didn't rebuke them for it either. When the woman that was caught in the act of adultery and thrown before Jesus, it was probably the most humiliating experience she has ever had in her whole life. They throw her before Jesus and they say, well, Moses said we're supposed to stone her. What do you say? And they're trying to trap Jesus or make him look bad. And finally he says, okay, whichever one of you doesn't have any sin, why don't you throw the first stone? And the Bible says they were convicted from the oldest to the youngest and eventually all walked away. And Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, nowhere. They're gone. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I think, <laughs> I think she found herself in this most humiliating experience that she'd ever been in her life, and Jesus changed it into something that empowered her to live for God. How do you think that woman felt coming out of that experience? I think she felt forgiven. I think she felt loved. I think she felt empowered to go and sin no more. I just think it's, it's interesting how Jesus treated sinners. Jesus never rebuked sinners. Do you know why? Because they weren't phony. They weren't hypocritical. They were, they were sinners. They knew they were sinners. They were sinners on the inside. They were sinners on the outside. They were sinners over here, and they were sinners over there. And see, God can work with that. God can transform that. God can bring change to that because they weren't hiding their stuff. One time Jesus said this to the Pharisees. It's Matthew 15, verse 7 and 8. He said, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying these people draw near to me with their mouth. They, they sound very spiritual, and they honor me with their lips. They were always giving God lip service, but their heart is far from me. They were going through all the motions and saying all the right words that, that people would think they're righteous and spiritual, but their hearts were far from God. The reason that hypocrisy is a problem is because God can only deal with the sin we acknowledge. He can only change us if we own our stuff. Jesus could work with sinners. They weren't pretending to be anything else. Sinners were always approaching Jesus, and he embraced them. He welcomed them to the chagrin of, of the religious leaders. Look who he's hanging out with now. But see, sinners weren't pretending to be anything than who they were. They didn't hide it, and Jesus welcomed them. When we say a person is a person of integrity... We are saying they're the same through and through. 
They, they are in alignment. They're the same inside and outside. And I want to make a statement I made a couple weeks ago that could easily be misconstrued, but I, I, I pray that it doesn't. Sinners often live with a greater integrity than religious people because they are the same outside and inside. They don't act any differently than they are. They, they don't put on errors. The whole idea of integrity does not imply perfection. My goodness, no. But it does imply someone who's not hiding their imperfections. Like, like as a Christian, I, I can say, this is who I am. This is me. God is not done with me yet. I, I'm still working through some things, but, I, but I'm honest about it. I'm not acting. I, I'm not performing for anyone. This is me. Now, here's another verse in Proverbs about integrity. Proverbs 11.3. Everybody okay? Who's not? I don't see that hand. Praise God. Did anybody lift their hand in Facebook Live? Could you tell us her? Okay. Proverbs 11.3, the integrity of the upright will guide them, but the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. Integrity will guide and preserve the upright, but the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. English Standard Version, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Do you think that's true? Will integrity preserve and guide you and perversity destroy you? Most of us here, no, it's true. Whether we choose to see it or not, we, we all know integrous people that, we, that we've seen prosper under the, the favor of God. We've also seen people who have lacked integrity. We, we've seen them fall. When a person walks with integrity, and again, and again, I want to say it, I'm not talking about living in perfection. But when a person walks with integrity, they do well in life. The blessing and the favor of God is on them. When a person lacks integrity, it will eventually destroy them. I, I know some people today that live with such regret because of choices they have made, because of walking without integrity. And as a result, lost relationships, lost time, lost marriages, lost jobs, even lost lives. Two guys that I, I played in a, a rock and roll band in. I, when I was a junior in high school, we, we formed a rock and roll band. And it was, we were called the New Revival. And it had absolutely nothing to do with revival. It was a time when Creedence Clearwater Revival was popular, so we were just trying to get on that. We were the new revival. And, and we played at, at DeSales a lot. We played at Community College. We even did a sock hop at Garrison one time. But, but, so I'm in this band, and, and when my senior year, I, I just think, I, I, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I can see the things that I'm allowing in my life as a result of this influence. I, and I thought, I've got to step away from this. So my senior year, I wasn't in that band. But, but two of the guys that were in that band are dead. And in all honesty, I wonder if I would be alive today had not God intervened in my life and pulled me out of that lifestyle. And we all know people. We all know people. We, we can see their lives, lost relationships, lost family. Because choosing to not walk with integrity a lack of integrity will bring destruction. The opposite of, of integrity is dishonesty, deception, duplicity, which means deceitfulness in, in, in words or, or conduct. But, but let me say it again. Integrity is not perfection. But it does just mean I'm honest. I'm not trying to hide those things in my life. It just means I'm being real. So, so, so catch this. Integrity is not a hard thing to experience. It is not difficult to step into this alignment that we are talking about. A unless you think it's perfection, then how could anyone attain it? It's a very simple thing to step into. It just involves being honest. 
being real. And see, being real is the foundation of the gospel. I must own my stuff to get saved. I must be honest and acknowledge my sinfulness before God in order to get right with him. And even as I walk with God, I must acknowledge my failures. I must acknowledge my sins to be forgiven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There, there's this place of, of, of owning my stuff. Integrity has to do with being in alignment with yourself. Everything is lined up. Now, I, I want to close. He said the word close. Just breathe that sigh of relief. I sense it in the atmosphere. I want to close for my first closing. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I, I want to close by, by talking about four distinct spheres, realms, or, or worlds, worlds of life and influence that we each live in. The first world that we have is number one. You know, you knew before I even said it. You live in a private world. That there is a part of you that no, where no one else goes. Not, not even those closest to you. Not even your spouse. They don't know all of your private thoughts. No one invades that place in your life except you and the God who knows everything. Number two, you also live in a personal world. This is the part of you that you, you share with a small circle of friends. Your, your, your spouse and, and immediate family and maybe a few friends that are really, you know really well. Now, before we get into the, the third area, our professional life, I want to say something. In your notes, integrity is rooted in our private world. It's the life that we develop alone with God in the secret place. In that hidden place, that's where integrity flows from. And see, from there, it flows into all of the, our other worlds. I, I, I've heard architects or, or engineers. My dad was a, a civil engineer. I've even heard home builders use this terminology. They will, they will say the, the, the words structural integrity. Anybody ever heard those, that phrase? Structural integrity. They, they were talking about the, uh, a building or a structure of some kind. And when they, they use that terminology, they, they are saying like the strength of that building or that skyscraper or, or any other building, relies on its private and unseen foundation that, that is dug deep into the earth and, and solidly constructed. Or, or let me say it this way. It, it's the hidden life of a building that brings structural integrity. It, it's the part of the building that you can't see, but that's what gives it it's structural integrity. When, when Mickey and I built the house we live in, <laughs> about a third into that, you think, what have we done? Whose idea was this? That we knew that, that if we could do a lot of the labor ourselves, we were the general contractors, and I knew how to do a lot of stuff because my dad had taught me. And you know, I had even poured concrete, I had poured sidewalks and driveways and patios, and I'd worked with it, but when it came to the foundation, I stepped away. And I said, I need to have a professional. Not someone that sort of knows what they're doing, me, I, I need someone who knows what they're doing to lay this foundation, and we'll build from there. Because the, 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 the structural stability of a house, is the weight of that is on the foundation. If you have a bad foundation, you can use the most expensive quality materials above it. It's too bad. It's a bad situation. But if the, if the foundation is solid, the weight of that house can rest upon that foundation and have structural integrity. 
Does that make sense? It's the hidden part of our life that gives us structural integrity. It's our private world that gives us that strength. It's the hidden life of an orange or an apple tree, that, that unseen root system that goes down deep into the soil. That's really what produces that juicy and delicious fruit. And so it, it, it is with us. Integrity is rooted in our private world, that which is not seen by others. In your notes, integrity is reflected in our personal world. Once an integrity is rooted in our private world, it begins to be reflected in our relationships with those closest to us. Now, see, some people wrongly think that integrity is rooted in these close interpersonal relationships. But that's not exactly true. It is only reflected there if we are already a person of integrity. That, that personal integrity comes out of our private life, but it is reflected in our personal life. If you, if you want to know whether someone has integrity, you, you can't go to their private world to find out, but you can ask their spouse or their children or their really close friends, those who really know them because integrity will be reflected in their personal world. Number three, this is your professional world. That, that sphere of life that may be ever widening. If you have a hidden life where your own integrity finds its roots, it will not only be reflected in your close relationships with those around you, but it will be reinforced in your day-to-day -day dealings in, in your work world. In your notes, integrity is reinforced in our professional world. One of the greatest opportunities to make a difference and to engage our culture is out in the marketplace. And, and uh, it's just so important that we as representatives of Jesus Christ, that we, that we spend that time quietly and privately with God and allow him to deal with, with our hard issues. It, it's so important that we allow that to happen so that it, when we step into the other worlds that we have, that, that, that our life is rooted in that integrity from the secret place. There's a small percentage of people in church on Sunday mornings, and it's even a much smaller percentage since COVID. However, on Monday, multitudes enter the marketplace. And they take notice of people of integrity. People of integrity stand out. Integrity is not rooted in our professional world. It is only reinforced there. And lastly, our, our public world. The world that, that we are in when we are out and about, when I'm not in the workforce or in the workplace, but I'm out and about, I, I'm doing life, I'm at the grocery store, I, I'm getting gas, I'm walking in the park, I'm going to Walmart, walking around my neighborhood, I'm playing disc golf with Dan or Kevin. If we are integrous with God in our heart, in the seeker place, in our private world, then in your notes, integrity is revealed in our public world. Once we thrust into the public arena, it's too late to look for integrity. If we do not already possess it, it's too late. Solomon's words ring true today. He who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will become known. Worship team, can I invite you to come? I want to say something that I, that I think is on an overhead, and, it, and it's this. When integrity is rooted in our private world, in, in our prayer life, in the secret place, it is reflected in, in our personal world. And it is reinforced in our professional world, and it is also revealed in our public world.
But, but here's, the, here's the takeaway for today, okay? It all starts between us and God. And I want to leave you with a, a verse of Scripture. And, and I encourage you to take this into your week. Because this is where integrity is rooted. That this is where our lives find structural integrity. I'm meeting, reading Matthew 6.6. 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. This is talking about a very specific kind of prayer. There are many kinds of prayer in the Bible. Paul talked about praying without ceasing. He talked about living in a conversation with God when you're at work, when you're, when you're out and about in the world. Wherever you are, just stay in communication with God. But this is another dimension of prayer. This is when you shut yourself off from the rest of the world and spend time with your father in the secret place. This is the place where integrity is rooted in our lives, where it is established in our lives. This is the place where God works on our hearts and our lives, and the, re the reward of it will be seen openly. It will be seen in my personal world. It will be seen in my professional world. It will be seen in my public world. Let's stand. I just want us to pray a very simple prayer. I'm assuming you have a song, your choice. Uh, I want us to pray a very simple prayer this morning. How many of you know you don't have to pray a long time to get results? Okay, pray this with me. Father, make me a person of integrity. Help me to come into alignment. I want to be in alignment with heaven. And I want to be in alignment with myself. I respond to you today, Holy Spirit. I respond to your call to spend time with you, to know you, to walk with you, and to reflect who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just take a minute and worship the Lord together.
Amen. I feel like I'm just supposed to launch you into your week and to launch you into a week of encounters with God. I'm not talking about the sky opening up and I'm talking about in your prayer times, just really sensing his presence and just experiencing God doing a deep work in our hearts. You know, we change from the inside out. And really, it's all God's grace because it's his working inside of us and he changes us. But, but if, you, if you heard the message today, what I was saying is this. As long as we hide things we're struggling with, we end up staying t tangled up in them. But the minute we're able to say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Can you pray for me? That's when transformation begins to take place. It's wonderful. So I want to invite the prayer teams to come and be available to pray with people today. I've got a benediction. Just not supposed to share it yet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Sometimes we're scared to really get alone with God because we think, man, I, I, I'm just, you know, God's probably really mad, with, mad at me and all these different things are going on. And then it's such a joy to discover that God knows everything about us and his arms are wide open and, and he, he just couldn't wait for you to open up your life to him in that way so he can begin to pour his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, and his empowerment into our lives. Does that make sense? So the benediction is 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. God bless you, saints. Have a great, great week.